Hey everyone, welcome back for more Bio 276, week 8, lecture 1, animal tissues. So overview of what we're talking about today and our objectives. So last time we looked at how plants reproduce and all the fun that comes with the alternation of generations, looking at the sporophyte generation and the gametophyte generation, how they vary depending on which type of plant you're looking at. Angiosperms require double fertilization, so you need an egg to fertilize or you need a sperm to fertilize the egg, and you need an, another sperm to fertilize the polar nuclei. Gymnosperms are just one egg, one sperm, easy. We dealt very briefly with how they develop in terms of looking at the positioning of the root and shoot apexes, and then they germinate. When we look at animals, and in class we did an exercise about trying to define plants and animals and realized rather quickly that this is actually not a fun game and we don't want to play it, is when we look at animals, they usually have two surfaces. This isn't entirely always true, but we, we can kind of say that, oh yeah, we, there does seem to be a pattern of this. And at some point in their lives, animals are going to be mobile. Again, not necessarily as much as we think, but there will be some stage of mobility. And because there is mobility, this changes how the animals are going to interact with their environment. And for the most part, there will be two points of interaction, again, at some point in existence. We'll have an outside surface and then an inside surface for exchange. When we look at the anatomy of animals... Depending on how complicated it gets, obviously we can add more stuff to this, but there always seems to be some anatomical similarities. We have some ability to bring food into the animal and have waste leave the animal. For the thicker animals, there'll be some type of circulation pattern that's not just dictated by diffusion. And there's going to be some need to regulate nitrogenous wastes. Because with animals, we don't process those that well, and they're toxic to us. Plants can deal with it. Fungi can deal with it. We, we have issues. Now, obviously, if you have animals that are fully mobile at all times, then there's some type of coordination of that motor ability. When we look at tissues in animals, there turn out to be four basic tissue types. Not all animals exhibit all four of these, but we can find similarities even amongst those animals that don't happen to show these. So like sponges would be the famous example that people think of. But we'll have epithelial and connective tissues, muscle tissues and nervous tissues. Both of these are for mobility. And they're all going to be bathed in some type of fluid that we call interstitial fluid. And there's a lot more interstitial fluid than there is blood. So we like to think of like, oh yes, everything's soaked in blood. And like, no, no, it's soaked in interstitial fluid. Some examples of interstitial fluid could be blood, but blood is not interstitial. Well, not all blood is... How am I trying to say this? Interstitial fluid is a bigger category than blood. So blood is interstitial fluid, but interstitial fluid is not blood. So if I look at those tissues, so the first one is an epithelial tissue. It is anything that creates a covering and lining. So any surface you can feel inside of an animal, that's going to be epithelial tissue that you're touching. Because it is constantly touching other stuff, it is falling off and it needs to regenerate. So it's usually a location where we start thinking in terms of, uh-oh, is this where cancer is going to show up? Because unlike with plants, with animals, cancer is a real possibility. The way that we name epithelial tissues is based upon the shape of the cells and then the number of layers it has. So when we look at them up top, they all look about the same. They look, they're hexagonal when you look at them from the top. But when you look at them from the side, they'll either be super skinny or they'll be like a cube or they'll be like a column. So they'll call them either squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. Connective tissues have three things in common. They all happen to have cells that are associated with forming the connective tissue. They have an extensive ability to, to modify that interstitial fluid space around them. And they also secrete lots of protein fibers. The cells that do the primary set of secretions are called fibroblasts. 
this is for the most part going to be the case. We have some connective tissues where they're not going to be fibroblasts or they're going to be fibroblasts going by a different name. But they're going to secrete those extracellular proteins, which end up generating the fibers. And then they're also going to modify what that extracellular environment looks like in terms of that gel or that matrix. Coincidentally, we can actually take an epithelium and a connective tissue and put them together and we make like a mini organ that's called a membrane. So this is not the same thing as a plasma membrane. So we just have to keep that in mind. So the most famous of these membranes is um, a mucous membrane. And a mucous membrane would be things that are like wet surfaces. And here... These two spellings are different. So this spelling here, mucous, is going to be the membrane. Whereas this one here with the mucus is going to be the stuff. And you do not necessarily have mucus on a mucus membrane. Although you can't find that there. Muscle tissues are excitable tissues, meaning they can react to electrical stimuli. They do not necessarily need to be attached to a skeleton, although we usually like to think of them as being attached to skeletons. There are three types that we can find across all the animals. The most basic is the smooth muscle, and that's going to be a very simple type of control. They don't necessarily need to be attached to muscles, or excuse me, attached to skeletons. Cardiac muscle is like a little bit more complex version of smooth muscle, and the origins of like the heart actually come from smooth muscle. So how that differentiation occurs, I personally don't know, but I'm sure that's a fascinating bit of evolutionary research. And then you have skeletal muscle, which is going to be highly structured. It is highly regulated. It needs a lot of control. Skeletal muscle needs something telling it what to do. Smooth and cardiac muscle do not necessarily need that. The last group is what we call the nervous tissues, and it's not really a tissue because it's more like a loose association of cells. The main cell that we deal with there is the neuron, and then it has support cells that we call glial cells. It is also an excitable tissue, and it usually serves as the regulator for muscles. When I start looking at all these tissues, I can organize tissues into organs, and I can then organize organs into organ systems. This table here, so 40.1, lists the organ systems of animals. And I can tell you right now that we can disrupt all of these and make different organ systems. So these are classic things that we think of, but in reality, all the organs interact with all of the other organs. So we can actually connect, I don't know, digestion with the integument because the integument is needed to make certain vitamins that you need for your digestive system to properly absorb those nutrients. We could deal with how your respiratory system is related to your integumentary system because it turns out that we do exchange gases through our skin, although very, very, very limited amounts. We could deal with how your immune responses, your immune system is actually more like a whole bunch of immune systems that we're just kind of clumping all together, but how your immune response is actually related to your skin. We can start mixing and matching all of these things and generating brand new systems. So, if I were to ever ask you, hey, name for me all the organ systems, it's, yeah, th there's no point. Because it's how many combinations do you want me to make? When we look at homeostasis in animals, it's a bit complicated, especially compared to, anim compared to plants, because we have a few extra pieces that we need to take into consideration. So recall that homeostasis is that dynamic equilibrium. Goal is just to keep you alive. With plants, it was mainly maintained through hormones or through just basic cellular processes. With animals, we have the nervous system, 
We have hormones, so endocrine secretions, but we also have exocrine secretions, things that we put on into our digestive tract, we put into our lungs, we put onto the surface of our skin that also help maintain homeostasis. So needless to say, this is going to get um, complicated. We can actually demonstrate the fact that depending on which animal you're looking at, this main this maintenance system will vary. A simple example of this would be, how does your body temperature vary with the environment? So the ambient or the environmental temperature, I can have it range you know, from 0 Celsius to 40 Celsius, which would be really, really hot. And then body temperature, if I take the bass, it turns out to change its temperature with the surrounding environment. It does not control its body temperature. That said, a river otter, like one of these monsters, you can find these in... South America, and you don't mess with these in any way, shape, or form. You say, oh, but it's an otter. It's so cute. Yeah, they're like six feet tall, six feet long. Like, you, you don't mess with these things. They they will take out much bigger predators than they are. They maintain their body temperature. And that tells you that, oh, hmm. So clearly homeostatic mechanisms to maintain body temperature will vary. When we've established that we need to have some type of regulation, this is going to be done through feedback loops. There's two versions, a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop. So positive feedback loops are amplification cascades where whatever's going on gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You could think of actual like feedback from like a microphone and a speaker. And that's because the sound coming out of the speaker is picked up by the microphone, which gets shot out of the speaker, which gets picked up by the microphone, which gets shot out the speaker, which gets picked up by the microphone, which gets shot back out the speaker. And the sound amplifies so fast that all you hear is a whoop, and then everyone freaks out. Similarly, you can have negative feedback, and the job of, or the mechanism of negative feedback is to undo the change. So it's the Le Chatelier's principle. If you increase the temperature, you need to decrease the temperature. But if you decrease the temperature, you now need to bring it back up. Uh-oh, now it's too high. Now you've got to bring it back down. Uh-oh, now it's too low. You've got to bring it back up. Your extracellular glucose is too high, so you need to bring it down. Uh-oh, now it's too low. Now you need to bring it back up. Uh-oh, now your extracellular glucose is too high, so you need to bring it back down. And you end up getting this oscillation between a maximum allowable value and a minimum allowable value. Sometimes the systems can be simple, sometimes they are not. So I can look at what's going on with your body temperature and melatonin, and typically we'd say like, oh yes, melatonin is going to tell you about body temperature, and the answer is no. Body temperature tells you about melatonin, which is the sleepy chemical, or the sleepy hormone. If I were to ask you, well, is there anything else that varies with this? And the answer is yes. Light tells you about this. Light also gets an influence with your melatonin concentrations. What's the pattern that we see? At least with us, humans, we actually need to drop our body temperature if we want to sleep. It's why when it's hot, you have a very difficult time sleeping. Also turns out that when I look at all of this here, there are patterns that we turn out to see. And this says this is the human circadian clock. In reality, each of these has its own timer, so these are actually circadian clocks. If you wanted to do something that's a little out of the ordinary, like you wanted to go to the top of Mount Everest, it turns out you couldn't just go there and go to the top. Your body would not survive because you don't happen to have the correct physiology to do this. So you have to acclimate. You need to figure out what do you need to do to reach this. So if you wanted to hike Everest, it's like a month-long expedition because you have to go to a base camp, which is so high up. You have to get used to it, then you have to hike up, and then you have to come back down, then you hike up, and then you come back down, then you hike up, and then you stay a little bit, then you come back down, and then you go back up, and then you wait, and then like you go to an intermediate, and then you like take the charge to the top. But each time, you have to give yourself time to do this. And since it's like a month-long expedition, clearly this is going to cost a lot of money. Next time, we're going to actually talk about... I don't know why it says list. We're going to talk about how neurons do their thing. So again, that's going to be membrane and action potentials. And it's a topic I love.